A bottle of wine contains more philosophy than all the books in the world, Louis Pasteur. And tonight, we're going to take that philosophy and rub it up against some stoicism, and we're going to do it as we explore life and wine. SIP episode 148 begins now. <music> Ladies and gentlemen, if this is your first time attending SIP, this is episode 148. My name is Martin Cody, co-founder of Cellar Angels, and Cellar Angels is a direct-to-consumer wine company specializing exclusively in Napa and Sonoma, limited production wineries uh, that are the best things coming out of Napa and Sonoma right now. So these are the wineries that you go and you find out about on your second, third, or multiple trips to Napa. After you get done visiting the mass-produced wines that have graced your store shelves and oftentimes your wine rooms at, at your homes and that you frequent with restaurants, you realize, wow, there's a whole world of wineries out here that I had no idea existed. Those are the wineries that Cellar Angels features and has been since 2010. So this little experiment started when the pandemic began in March, and now we're slowly marching toward episode 150, which will be coming up in two weeks. That'll be a social sip where you are encouraged to turn on your camera, come fully clothed, and participate with uh, wine and questions. Speaking of questions, tonight's topic is wine and life philosophy of wine and life. And before I get to tonight's guest, I do want to let you know about this week's quiz winner. So the Monday pop quiz was, the question was, Dionysus was the Greek god of wine. Who was the goddess of harvest? Now, show of hands, how many people did not know there was a goddess of harvest? I'd be the first one to admit that. Uh, the answer was C, Demeter. Demeter, do we have any Greek studies uh, experts on the line that could tell us the correct pronunciation. Doesn't matter. Brent H was the winner with the correct answer. Doug R, you were right on the heels about 120 seconds after. And then MJ, I don't see MJ right now. Alyssa, good to see you. Uh, MJ was third. Jim B, where are, where was Jim B this week? Uh, troubling. Brent, we're going to put 100 loyalty points in your account. Uh, looking forward to uh, you're redeeming those soon, maybe a holiday gift for yourself, by the way. Uh, so let's get on to it with regards to tonight's guest, because all of us have waxed poetic at one point in time over a glass or two or three or a couple bottles of wine uh, with the analysis of life. And so tonight's topic was chosen by this evening's guest. And I want to bring on tonight's guest, uh, Ignacio Degadio, who has been a tremendous supporter of Cellar Angels for many, many years. And everybody give it up for Ignacio. There hey, we go. Martin. Hey, 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 good to see you. Um, I think before we get started, I did want to say one thing. And I did just want to share how thankful I am to be on the show again, to uh, do this again with you guys. And uh, I've been sort of mulling it over and just thinking about how uh, you know, grateful I am to have met you and Denise and the, you know, the relationship that we've developed over the years. And so I'm just super happy that our paths uh, crossed in life and that we have been able to be good friends as a result. Uh, and us too. And, and thank you so much for saying that we feel the exact same way. And just fun fact, people, some of you have actually met Iggy when we do our trips out to the Valley and, and take you behind the scenes for filming. Uh, we first met Iggy, he was not married, uh, did not have not even a shade of a romance. In, in <laughs> uh, and now married to an unbelievable young lady and has two children, the ages of which are seven and three, which makes me feel old. Uh, Hans and Caitlin, good to see you. Ivana, nice to see you. Thanks for coming. So um, Iggy, why don't you, for there's a bunch of people that have not met you, but tell folks where you're sitting right now. And I, I kind of want you to give me a, a brief bio, if you will, of, okay, uh, how did I get into the wine industry and and where am I and how did it happen? Um, so uh, right now we're, we're, we're in our winemaking facility at Napa. So this is where we make the wine. Right behind me is the 23 and 22 vintages in these barrels. Um, how I got started in wine was not by my choice. <laughs> so... Uh, my dad's been in the um, 
has been in Napa making wine since the mid seventies. And so, uh, so, so Napa, St. Helena is where I was born and raised. And as a result, just because of my dad being very old fashioned and uh, taking me to work on Saturdays at 5 a.m. when I'm five and six years old. <laughs> uh, so there wasn't, there wasn't really escaping it. And um, I gotta say, uh, uh, it's a good thing that it happened uh, for several reasons. One, it, um, it taught me a good work ethic because I was always with my dad. The, the fondest memories I have as a child is walking behind the tractor in a vineyard uh, and my dad telling me to go wait in his VW bug um, because I was getting covered in dust following you know, a tractor. Uh, and then, um, as things progressed, um, you know, I learned, I learned a lot just by accident, just by being around it and helping my dad. Uh, I think I was like eight or nine when he took me to Fremark Abbey, by the way, don't tell anybody this. Uh, and I would do pump overs with them, you know, like looking over a tank, holding a big four inch hose. Uh, and so it's just always been a part of me. And as much as I tried to escape Napa in my late teens, early twenties, uh, there was something always that drew me back. Um, and uh, it kind of has to do a lot with our topic today, but but the biggest one was just family. And, you know, now the way I see it is working with my dad is probably one of the best things I could have ever hoped for because I get to spend every day with him. And as a father, I understand that more. Uh, but, you know, uh, I can't, I couldn't ask for, you know, for a better job. It's interesting at the Fremark Abbey, where you were doing pump overs at five, if we're holding on to those vintages, should we look at them suspiciously? Should we? Do you, do you remember? Oh, 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 I think they're. I think they're even better. I mean, accidents sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell well, you which I, ones to look for. They're they're uh, they're made a little a little better than the other ones. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. And I think it's interesting because I'm trying to think. I, I never went to work with my dad. I mean, you know, dad was an insurance salesman for Allstate in the Chicagoland area. And I, I don't ever recall, this was way before, obviously, you know, take your son or daughter to work day type of stuff. Mom was a secretary in the secretary pool for anybody that's old enough to remember what those were. But you're at the age of five and you're getting taken to work. Um, did it seem like work or were you like, hey, I'm just going out with dad and we're going to go play in the field? No, I hated it. I mean, <laughs> uh, I wanted to stay in bed and I didn't want to, you know, uh, wake up, but, um, but it ended up being fun because I ended up having to really, and this is, I think something that I see now as a dad is that we try to do so much with our kids that we forget to let them get bored because when, when, when kids get bored is when their imagination sort of gets sparked and they start to just become creative on their own. And I had a lot of time to myself to really just do a bunch of stuff. So, I mean, I remember, I remember the, um, the shop there. Um, there was a bunch of antiques like that somebody stored in there. So I would always go and find little, little trinkets or, I mean, it kind of, it, it's kind of weird when you think about it. Cause I'm like, well, I could have chopped off my hand, you know, maybe playing with a, <laughs> you know, you know, with the saw that was in the shop and nobody would have found me for maybe like five hours. But, um, but no, that was, um, that was a lot of fun. I just, you know, it, there wasn't really, uh, there was a freedom to it that, that I appreciate now. And, and I don't know, even if I would do it with my kids, just because maybe I think I'm being a little overprotective, but right. I mean, that, that freedom is, is something that I look back on. That was pretty amazing. No, that's incredible. It's, it's interesting too, because it's a different philosophy back then. And we're going to be talking about life and philosophy tonight. And so I, I, Obviously, it was first turned on when you only had one SKU, uh, the you know the blockbuster Cabernet that you have, and I'm curious what your dad's philosophy was as it relates to Cabernet, because if you're going to be in Napa Valley, you better be making Cabernet, and it should be noteworthy. So, what did he teach you about Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, to where you started to form your own philosophy? Um, well, in terms of like uh, wine um, structure. Uh... I think what, well, there's a lot there. And so what I learned, what I learned is that I like wines that have uh, maturity and complexity and that are wines that are strong, that stand out on their own. And cabs in general, what's great about cabs is that there's a huge versatility with them. Um, all, all three of these uh, wines are made from cab, including the rosé. And so uh, uh, it's a very versatile grape, but it's also very masculine um it's a very strong grape uh and so there's 
there are characteristics that I see personally in wine that I can tie to because it's also, you know, you know, I would say speaking about stoic stuff, it's a very stoic grape uh, because it mm. needs, um, it needs sort of that, you know, they call it the king of grapes for a reason. Right. Uh, and what I like about it is that when you give it age um, and you have patience uh, uh, to age the wine, you get a characteristic that you can't get any, any other way. So you have to start with an intense wine that uh, needs that time in the bottle to, uh, to settle down. And I, uh, I've used this analogy before and I'll share it again, is that I, I look at cab as sort of uh, a man, right? And so when you have a young Cabernet, it's like, it's like talking to a teenage boy, right? There's a lot of intensity, but no real focus in any direction. So you, so you can't really maybe sit down with the teenager and have a very intense conversation. But once, uh, once you, um, you, you know, cause on the palate, the way I describe that is, you know, you have alcohol fighting for your attention. You have the oak and the fruit and the tannins and everything sort of in your face, like, like, like give me, you know, give me the spotlight. Give when me attention. Age, yeah, exactly. And so when you age the wine, it's kind of letting that teenage boy sort of mature into a man. And then everything settles down and it's sort of like sitting down with the most interesting man in the world, right? You're, you're going to sit down and it's somebody that doesn't, um, it doesn't ask for your attention, but you naturally are attracted to them. They just have an energy about them. And then you just start uncover, you know, peeling back the layers and they can tell you story after story after story. And you're like, wow, this person is amazing. Um, and that's what, what a cab like this is after you have the age, you get, uh, uh, everything is really well integrated. All the, those layers that we spoke about earlier, the alcohol, the tannins and the fruit and the oak, they reveal themselves slowly. And sort of as it, as it opens up and it has time to decant, it, it's telling you those stories as it's changing and evolving in the glass. And so that's, I think what I really like about Cab is that if you give it the proper attention and the proper time to make it uh, correctly, you're gonna have a wine that um, not only ages well, but just just keeps keeps uh, you know delivering every time you drink it, and I, and I like the analogy with regards to the prepubescent boy and maturing into an, an adult. I also believe that similar to the boy, that the the vineyard selection or the genealogy of that that vine or that bottle or that vineyard source also mm -hmm. has a lot to do with the evolution of the maturity process, not too dissimilar that, you know, and this is, this is going to be the segment of the show that begins to get deep uh, into more of the, the philosophical esoteric perspectives. But, you know, if you, if you have a, a broken home, the, the child's not going to get the same level of parenting, lame, same level of nurturing, same level of, of, you know, boredom to be able to think creatively uh, mom or dad might be working multiple jobs. And so the, the parenting aspect has a huge influence on it, uh, on mm -hmm. the way the child turns out, not too dissimilar to the vineyard source uh, with regards to how have these vines been treated over the years? How old are these vines? So talk to us a little bit about kind of the philosophy your father imparted on you on, on vineyard selection and how you today uh, go about finding vineyards to produce the cabs that you produce. Um, well, uh, not to sound cliche, but it's, but it's terroir, right? You, you, you know, you have, um, a certain characteristic that only the weather and the soil can give you, right? And that, com and that, that combo is going to change depending on where you are in the valley. I think what, what I've seen, um, has resulted in really good cabs, um, this year in particular, actually, um, so our Coombsville Vineyard, Coombsville is just an area that's, I think is fantastic for cabs because it, generally it tends to be a little bit cooler. So for the style of wine that we make for, uh, for this one, which is, uh, which is aged for eight years before we release it, um, uh, five years in the bottle and three years in the barrel. That's what, what that, that, by the way, that's, that's not a typo. Uh, I don't know what the verbal equivalent is of typo, but that's, that's eight years of aging prior to it being released unheard yeah. of in the United States. Yeah. 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 A lot of people, a lot of people don't do it. Um, I mean, very, very few do it as their main, as their main wine. I don't, I don't really know anybody else who does it uh, that way, but that's, but that's a lot of reason. Again, like you were, uh, like you had the analogy for parenting. It really comes down to the time and attention that you play into it. The vineyard is, 
um, is no different. Um, so, so soil and weather play a huge impact on what you do, but also how you cultivate the grapes, how, the attention that you put into um, those grapes is a, um, is a big deal. So this year I had, uh, I, I mean, this was a real honor is to be able to, re we replanted our Mill Creek Vineyard in St. Helena. And so we pulled out the vines and we were able to put uh, everything new from the ground up. So to be able to go through that whole process with my dad, we got to pick the rootstock, uh, pick the clones, um, and just kind of, I like to geek out in all the science stuff. So, so I really got to get my feet wet in that. And what I learned is, you know, you have a couple of, a couple of variables where, where you want to choose to correct root, rootstock and that, but what it comes down to at the end of the day is how you're going to care for them, how you're going to trellis them and how you're going to prune them. Um, and that just depends on how much work you're willing to put into the grapes, you know, um, what we do is we uh, we have a method of extreme, I, I call it extreme micromanaging because that's really the only way to do it, uh, uh, to explain it. But it's really, you know, we have a lot of attention that goes into not only the grapes individually, um, but the whole process from picking the grapes to processing them here and uh, putting them into the bottle. Uh, I don't know how else to do it. I mean, there's uh, um, I'm trying to think of an analogy, but really it's the only thing is the more work you put into it, the more you get out of it. Um, you know, and that's really yep. uh, how we are with the, uh, with the vines and how we pick certain areas uh, for cab. I mean, it's kind of hard to find a spot in Napa unless you get like really clay, clay soils or soils that don't drain well. It's probably like one of the only few times that you can't find a good spot to grow cab in the Napa Valley. <laughs> It, no, and it's funny. I mean, I refer to it as the dandelion of wines because it just basically grows anywhere from that standpoint. Yeah. But it's, and for those of you that don't know the Mill Creek Vineyard, the picture behind me and is we've kind of doctored it a little bit to make it artistic, uh, or I should say a mission control did. But this is from a lunch that we had in the Mill Creek Vineyard. And I know probably tearing out with, with Iggy, by the way, uh, many years ago, but probably tearing out that vineyard was a little bit bittersweet. Mission Control calls it the single best day of work she's ever had. Uh, there's a couple of folks, uh, I believe in the chat tonight that were at that lunch, but this was 70, at the time, this was probably what, eight, nine years ago or so, 75 yeah. year old Cabernet vines. So that's unheard of in Napa Valley, precisely because of what Iggy was talking about is, you know, the yield is down. Uh, it's harder for them to do what they're supposed to do at that age. You, you you could walk through the vineyard and you would have a vine, a vine, and then five missing vines that, you know, had died mm -hmm. at some point in time. So I'm excited for you to be able to do that with your dad from the ground up. But I would imagine there was some um, some heartstrings tugged upon to say, are we really going to tear up these these beautiful old ancient vines? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, it, was, it was pretty tough. I actually still... I kept one. Um, uh, uh, so we're going to try to see if we can keep it whole and turn it into a little centerpiece or something, but oh, super cool. Uh, um, it is one of those things that it's hard because it is something that you put a lot of work in, but it, it had also gotten to the point where, um, you know, some of it, some of it does come down to economics where it was costing us more to farm, um, farm the grapes than the amount of grapes that we were getting back. And right. we tried for about, we tried for about four years to try to really get those vines to come back um, uh, uh, with a lot of different techniques, but ultimately every year the yield just kept getting smaller and smaller. And so we said, well, you know, at this point we have to kind of cut our losses and, um, and pull them out. So that's another good story because half of the vineyard was those 75 year old vines. Uh, and the other half was vineyards that um, were planted in 2015. And so the owner of that vineyard, when that was replanted in 2015, we actually helped them mm -hmm. replant that vineyard. And so uh, uh, our age cab vintages one through four came from that vineyard. 2005 was the only year of, of the age cab that was a mix of both Mill Creek and Coombsville. And then 2006 to present has all been Coombsville. So uh. when we replanted that vineyard in 2005, uh, 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 the owner was a family friend of ours. And so we said, you know what? we can't use all these grapes. So why don't you lease it out and have somebody else, you know, use it and, you know, you can get uh, the benefit from it that way. And then in 2013, we kind of saw what, what had happened to the vineyard in between. And 
it's a really good example of what happens when you let the marketing team um, drive the <laughs> vineyard production because they were overstressing the vines and basically killed them. They stunt their growth. Um, you know, when we pulled them out, the roots were like probably about this deep. And so it's, uh, it's one of those things that- How deep uh, should they have been? Uh, they should have been probably like 10 feet and uh, okay. uh, um, or deeper. I mean, when we, we had a hard time pulling out the 75 year old vines and that's what was crazy. So the 75 year old vines were dying because they were AXR1 and St. George rootstocks, which uh, are greatly affected by phylloxera. And as we know, they you know, phylloxera came in and wiped their, so those plants that were left over survived the phylloxera attack. So they were already like pretty damaged to begin with but they were out producing the younger vines. And, um, you know, we, uh, and that's when we decided to take it over. Cause we said, look, these guys aren't paying you hardly anything for these grapes. They're driving your vineyard into the ground. And, you know, we, we hate to see this. And so that's when we took the vineyard back over and, um, we were trying to bring it back. It didn't work. And so then we decided to replant it. Oh, wow. All right. I'm going to, um, share my screen and put Iggy on the spot. Uh, for all of the Stoics among us, uh, this is your section of the broadcast uh, because we're going to kind of compare and contrast uh, life, philosophy, and wine. And I I'm curious, you know, you started Iggy in the Valley before we begin the deck uh, with your father, and now you are a father. How has fatherhood changed your philosophy as it relates to life or as it relates to kind of the wine business and sp specifically dig a deal? Yeah, I mean that's a that's a huge question only because there's there's so much that goes with that, right? I um the first thing I could say is the the day my son was born cuz he was the one that was born first. The moment he was born, I understood such a greater sense of purpose um in my life that I hadn't felt before. So I knew that when he was born and, and just the fact of you know, my wife and I creating a person that like, to me brought out, like, this is why we're here. <laughs> you know, it was like, this is, this is what it's all about. Um, and as, uh, and as I grew, you know, as I progressed in fatherhood, I guess I'm not even that far in, in um, seven years, I started to understand my father more. And so a lot of the stuff that he did when I was growing up that I didn't understand, I could definitely understand now. Um, and so now having that appreciate, you know, it's like, uh, it's one of those things where you really don't get certain things until, until you right. actually experience them and take action towards them. Um, so That's that, that, that age old line the older I get, the smarter my parents get. Yeah, 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 exactly. And it's, um, and the other thing for me personally, it's probably been, the best experience to try to make myself a better person because um, kids are like sponges. And so they absorb and they're more intuitive than we sort of give them credit as adults because as adults, I think we've become really calloused to certain things as time goes by, but kids are pure, they're innocent and they will absorb anything. And they look at you as a parent, as, as like the biggest person, you know, they're, right. they're superhero in their life. And yep. so, you know, it, you know, quoting superheroes with, uh, uh, you know, with uh, great power comes great responsibility, right? And so, what uh, what I've learned there is I uh, I can only explain so much to my kids in terms of trying to teach them things, but the best thing that I could do is become the person that they want to uh, that I want them to become and have them emulate that because. Um, it's easy, it's easy to talk, but it's harder to do things. And sometimes with kids, they'll just pick things up as normal, as long as you're setting the example. And so that to me has probably been the biggest thing in fatherhood is not only making me a better person, but trying to think of becoming the person that I want my kids to become. So it's yep. kind of like that quantum loop there, you know, about the past influencing the present and dictating the future. Agreed. Uh, a little bit of Mahatma Gandhi, you know, be the change you want to see in the world, but also be the person that you want your children to be in the world. Uh, one of the great thinkers, but I want to throw up, but you know, here's a whole bunch of thinkers that uh, a lot of modern day wisdom and ancient philosophy, everyone knows Lincoln, uh, Abraham Maslow, uh, the hierarchy of needs, uh, author of everything, you know, self-actualizing, 
Epictetus, one of the great Stoic philosophers, MLK, uh, Marcus Aurelius. If anybody, if you haven't read Meditations, it's an unbelievable book from a Stoic guideline or guide uh, that you should read. And then, of course, Seneca. And so uh, these are just a, a smattering of great thinkers and, and life lessons that we're going to kind of impart some of their wisdom and, and put up some quotes and then compare and contrast some of the ancient wisdom and, and their philosophy with both wine and life. And, and I'm putting Iggy in the spot because he hasn't seen these quotes. Uh, and then we're going to come uh, circle back after that. I've got 10 questions for you from Jackie that um, she put together. Uh, I'm just teasing. Jackie doesn't have any questions. <laughs> <laughs> So the first one uh, I think is interesting because this is Epictetus, great Stoic philosopher. If you are ever attempted to look for outside approval, realize that you have already compromised your own integrity. If you need a witness, be your own. Oh, man. And, yeah, and that's here, good. Here's why I think this is interesting from a parallel standpoint, because you could, I mean, this obviously doesn't deal with Instagram likes or, you know, Facebook likes or anything like that, which is external approval but you could theoretically as it applies to wine say is this analogous to sending wine out to be rated by a critic is this submitting wines in competitions to get outside approval i mean there's a lot of overlap here what are your thoughts yeah 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 i mean i mean in that vein that's exactly what we do i mean when we started this whole process of aging the wine um it wasn't because we had a target demographic or certain critics that we wanted to make the wine for. This was just the wine, the style that my dad loved to make. And um, he doesn't make wine for anybody else but himself. So he does, this is just the wine that he absolutely loves to drink. And I think because of that, and this is a good example to reflect in yourself, is if you just focus on becoming your, your, your most authentic self, the most authentic person you can be being honest and respectful and loving yourself, you're going to come out with the best person. And the wine is no different. So if you're making wine uh, authentically to what you know how to make and how you want to make it, that's how it's going to transpire into a wine that people will enjoy. Um, when you try to please one person, you're not going to please anybody uh, unless that person is yourself. Because if you don't win at pleasing everybody, you, you have at least one at pleasing you know, your internal self. And so that's a, uh, you know, that, that is huge because once, once you can achieve that, what people witness is, uh, uh, basically the best product that, uh, the best byproduct that you can do and it's authentic. So people will naturally just gravitate towards that. Well, and I think it's interesting too, because you just talked about it in reference to the vineyard where the marketing group was trying to influence the vines to produce a wine that they thought would have greater appeal. And at the end of the day, they ended up killing the vines. And so that had to be, uh, you know, chasing scores, chasing an audience, uh, get, that's a zero sum game that has, or death by a thousand paper cuts, pick whatever one you want, because you'll never find ultimate fulfillment or ultimate satisfaction because the market is so fleeting. But I love the philosophy that your father has where he, he's producing wine that he loves in an authentic manner. And you've picked up that style quite well. Uh, and and it's made in a, in a style and a manner and with precision and dedication and by hand that that resonates with people. So I, I, I like the way you've done that. This is another one. We live in deeds, not in years, in thoughts, not breaths, in feelings, not figures on a dial. We should count time by heartthrobs. And my my parallel to this in wine, and, and I'm sure uh, Aristotle, you know, figures on a dial was all they had back then from a technology standpoint. But here we've got dashboards, we've got micromanagement of things, you've got uh, all sorts of different factors to influence from KPIs. But if, if you're doing thing by deeds and winemaking is just hundreds of deeds, you know, depending upon who you're working with, who your growers are, who you're, where you're buying the rootstock from all of these different things. And your word is your bond for most of it. Um, that's where, where it matters in that transactional component of, of person to person versus you know chasing something that's fleeting or having uh high rankings and and you know you could kill a marketing report type of stuff or mm -hmm. impressions on a blog post could go through the roof 
But if, if no one believes what you're doing is authentic or believes in you, uh, or that you haven't touched their heart, you're going to have a, a hard time being sustainable. What is yeah. this? What does Aristotle's quote mean to you? And well, why? I'm uh, well. If I'm looking at it, um, if I'm understanding it correctly, it means that um, it's it's basically the relationship you have, the relationship that you're developing, right? So you're not doing things, um, you know, for. Uh, you're not sacrificing your motives for something that's not pure with your purpose. Right. And so if you, um, I would say like the, you know, like we live in deeds and not in years, you know, and that's true. So what deeds that we produce, the, the things that we do are what, you know, the action that we take is what's going to dictate the results that we get. So that's where the little day-to-day -day standards that you put into your life, whether you wake up early or you're, you know, reading your book or exercising and eating right, that is more important than counting how many years have gone by because you, uh, you can change a lot in a small amount of time if you have the right purpose and the right action towards it. Um, uh, and, and, and that's the same with, with wine. We wouldn't be able to make a wine that ages for eight years if we didn't have that consistency and working in the little details in the vineyard versus just thinking about how many years it's going to be in the bottle. In thoughts, not in breasts. Yeah, I mean, it. I, I mean, that's huge. Your, uh, you know, your thoughts dictate your actions. And so what you think is basically what, what you become. So if you're letting yourself um, sort of have uh, negative thoughts and not, not really searching for things that bring you happiness in your own mind and your own subconscious, then, you know, you might as well not, not be alive. Right. And uh, you know, uh, I shared this with you, but when you hear sometimes a saying that, you know, a man uh, dies at 40 and he's just being waited, uh, it's just waiting to get buried at 80. And I think that has a lot to do with it because you can still have breath, but if your thoughts aren't there, you know, uh, if your right. heart isn't there, there's no point. And same with feelings, you know, feelings, feelings, um, someone described uh, feelings to me as you have somewhere with roughly roughly about like 64,000 thoughts in your head every day. And you can't possibly give the attention to it that, you know, each individual thought the attention that it needs to sort of clear, clear it out of your head. And so they manifest uh, in feelings. And so feelings have such a deep impact in, um, in everything and in, in how well you feel and how, how you perceive sort of the world around you. And sometimes, sometimes a feeling is more important than, you know, than the goal. Um, because ultimately that's the only thing that you really take, you know, the only thing that's real. Um, and, I, and, and sorry, go ahead. No, I, I was gonna say, I also think you talked a little bit about it. Deeds could also be how you're taking care of the land. Yeah. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. 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 So, um, um, yeah, yeah. How you're taking care of the land. Um, all the, even in the cellar, like the little details that normally somebody could rush through and say, okay, well, we don't need to worry about this. It's not that important. Like, oh, we're just going to top uh, 10 barrels. Let's just use whatever wine we use to top down. And you could be diluting all of those barrels with some really bad wine. Right. Um, in instead of diluting it with something better. Um, the, uh, the whole feelings thing, I think, really relates, can relate good to wine in terms of how you enjoy it and, and, and how you taste it. Because um, I think how people get attracted to a wine is what memories and what feelings it invokes inside of them based on their past experiences. And I think that's, um, that's another big one. Yeah. And I think that's why wine is just so mesmerizing and evocative from an emotional standpoint, because it touches so many different thoughts and so many different feelings. Now, when people show you who they are, believe them the first time. I don't know if you know who the author of this quote is, which is why I put question marks there. No, no, I don't know. It's a good one. It, and it, uh, it's a quote by Maya Angelou, and it is an interesting one because this gets back to that authenticity that you talked about, uh, both mm -hmm. authenticity in how you conduct yourself with your children, but not only that, but also how you conduct yourself with uh, customers, family members, strangers, uh, mm -hmm. that sort of stuff. Uh, do you keep your promises? Do you do what you say you're going to do? Uh, do you overpromise and under deliver? And so there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of amazing people in the wine industry, 
there's also some not so amazing people in the wine industry. And, yeah. and so you, you kind of have to be careful. Um, it's a delicate balance, right. Of extending yourself over and over again. And then if, you know, it's the fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me philosophy, where how many more times can I be taken advantage of? And why don't I just follow this doctrine? So how do you take into consideration uh, charlatans, shysters, uh, people that actually show you who they are and and you end up not believing them and then you get burned again? Yeah, well, I think um, I think for the most part, uh you know, you need to have a certain level of trust with people. And, um, and usually, I mean, unless there's some red flags, I tend to trust people when they say what they're going to do, but you find out really quickly if that's the person that they really are or not. So I like giving everybody the benefit of the doubt. Um, but there's also, I think over time, I think you sort of develop an energy on reading people just, just based on their body posture, how they talk, and you can kind of get a vibe off of them where you're like, I've, seen this before you know and uh yeah and um you know i've had a lot of experience where i've sort of learned that the hard way where you know you trust someone and then you get burned Mm -hmm. whether it's on a business deal or just you know a certain a certain potential customer that they they have a certain way of you know getting three or four bottles out of you because they keep getting corked over and over again or something you know where where, um but you but you end up just over time start uh, start developing that, but I don't think that um, I go I go through life thinking that there are negative people out there because I know that there are. But at the same time, what I I think what I try to focus on is the opposite: um, is that when you do find someone that really resonates in your life, uh, I tend to try to keep those people around and sure. uh, and try to build that um, you know that circle and that community um, in my life. Uh, you know, one really big example of that right now is even the um, the community that I have at the gym. Um, you know, they all uh, uh, they uh, they're called the Five AM Club. You know, because <laughs> uh, they're all there early. But that group of people really, I think, has showed me that um, it doesn't really matter where you're progressing. Everybody has the same goal, and everybody's there to help each other. Um, and so you meet a lot of people through wine that way because wine really opens that door to really uh, uh, to share it. If you're not sharing it as a business, if you're not looking at a dollar symbol, if you're looking at building a relationship, wine is the easiest, you know, the easiest yeah. pathway um, um, great, to that. Great vehicle for that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and it's how we've always shared our wine over the years. So a lot of people ask me, well, how do you structure your tastings? You know, like how much do you charge? And normally Normally we don't even charge. And what we do is we just sit down and we open up some wine and we, we talk. And most of the time we're talking about everything else except the wine. And, and, and I think that's, I think that's a much better approach and a much more genuine approach than trying to just, you know, pour wine, like a lot of wine tasting rooms do. They'll, they'll just pour the wine, give you like a memorized uh, two or three minutes about the story and then, and then walk away. And then you and then kind give of you left. an order sheet and then come back and check on you. Yeah. It's, yeah. I, yeah. And then get upset why you haven't signed up for their, for their wine club, you know? <laughs> so, so uh, I know I'm calling out some people out there, but it's, uh, but it's the truth. I mean, we don't, we don't like being on a real, uh, you know, on a transactional basis. We like to do things on a relationship basis. Here's uh, another stoic one, actually from Epictetus again. No great thing is created suddenly, any more than a bunch of grapes, emphasis my own, or a fig. If you tell me that you desire a fig, I answer that there must be time. Let it first blossom, then then bear fruit, then ripen. And I think this is interesting because we live in an absolute instant gratification world right Mm -hmm. now. And wine, especially when you're talking about aging it for eight years, when you're talking about planting a new vineyard where it's three to four years before you can get commercially available fruit, it, it forces you to slow down. How, how do you balance the instant gratification, instant always on world with technology and and all the stimulus that is around us today with the very, very slow methodic aspect of of winemaking and, and vineyard management and grape growing. 
Yeah, well, I think uh, uh, going back to your question of what are what are the things that my dad, uh, the one of the most important things that my dad imparted to me during this whole process of making wine is is that patience. Um, a lot of times we want to work hard at something, and just because just for the sole reason that we've worked hard, we expect a quick result, and we have to kind of look back and think about going back to the purpose of why we're doing things and why are we doing all this work. And if the result is money, you're never going to have a quick, a quick answer. Um, if it's, you know, if, if you're looking for quick fame, it's, a, it's the same, it's, a, it's the same thing. And mm -hmm. so when you have, when you have a more direct purpose and our purpose was to just to make a really good clean cab, the aging process doesn't, doesn't become the setback. Um, it just becomes, it just becomes the journey. And when you learn to appreciate the journey more than, more than the goal, um, then you every day you're basically at a hundred percent. you know, you're not wishing you could be doing more because you're already trying the hardest that you can and you're doing everything that you can and you're moving as fast as the process will, will allow you. So once you learn how to do that, I mean, and, and that can be said for anything in life. Um, you know, anything that is worth it takes a lot of work. And in some instances does take a little bit of time, but yeah, uh, I think we forget about that too often. It, it, you, we want things yesterday. You can get eyeglasses in about an hour. You can get this and, you know, 30 minutes or less. And we get so conditioned. Uh, and I think Amazon was a big uh, instigator of that, or I'm sorry, not Amazon, Google. You know, when we used to do searches 10, 15 years ago, it was like, you got 254 million responses in 0.73 seconds. And so you get conditioned yeah. that it has to be this fast all the time. And I would imagine it gets challenging, but I think you've got a great handle on it to balance that with the industry that you're in, that this is going to take time. Mother nature works on her own or her own patience and her own cadence. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So more stoicism. The, and you just talked about impediments and, and difficulties. Uh, the impediment to action advances the action. What stands in the way becomes the way. And again, Aurelius is one of my favorites, just amazing and, and probably one of the most quoted philosophers or stoic philosophers. Uh, Ryan Holiday has written a couple of books on him uh, with regards to stoicism. But give me an example from a wine perspective of obstacles that you've had to overcome that you didn't want to overcome that you realized success in the endeavor was actually on the other side of that obstacle? Um, um, I could tell you when we released the wine, when we released this cab. So we started making this cab in, uh, uh, in 2001 and we didn't release it until April of 2009. And so April of 2009 was right, right there at the peak of the recession. And it's oh, probably that's the right. Yeah. <laughs> And it was probably right, right the, in the middle of the global economic collapse. Yeah. Yeah. It was probably the worst time to release a, a premium cab at a premium price point with a name that not a lot of people can pronounce. And so, uh, uh, so this story sort of starts back when my dad started to make the wine in 2001. I said, Hey dad, if you keep making the wine, I'll sell it for you. And so that's how we got started making Delgadillo wine. Uh, but we ate, but you know, but, but then my dad decided to, uh, to age it. So when I told my dad, hey, dad, I'll sell it for you. I was still in high school. And so <laughs> going back to the analogy of, of you know, of Cab being a, a, young, a young man, of course, in yep. high school, I knew everything there was to know about the world. And growing up in Napa, I was, I was an expert. I was like, how hard, how hard can this be? And so April of 2009 rolls around and I'm just gun ho about selling this uh, wine because because we've been sitting on it for so long. And um, it was probably the hardest thing that I have done in terms of starting this brand was trying to get the name out there and, and get sales in a time where people weren't really buying a lot. But what that taught me was if you can show value in what you're providing. So the price doesn't necessarily mean a lot when you're providing something that people perceive as valuable. And that's what I learned is that's where the quality of the wine started to pay off because those years of aging really made the wine stand out. And when we were going to tastings and showcasing the wine, it was, it was better than a lot of wines that were out there. And when people looked at the price point, they were like, oh yeah, of course, of course we're going to buy this wine. And so that's what taught me that if you focus on quality first, uh, 
it doesn't matter. You know, there's no such thing as a recession if it's something that people want. Right. It's interesting when you look at some of the, uh, you mentioned the 5 a.m. club uh, group at the gym, and it's uh, probably named after the 5 a.m. club book by Robin Sharma, who's also another great thought leader. Uh, but you you look at these folks, that the elite athletes, the elite business people, uh, the Ray Dalios of Bridgewater and, and the inventors, they look for the obstacles. Uh, mm -hmm. Ryan Holiday has a book called The Obstacle is the Way because on the other side of that obstacle, they're going to improve. And it's a philosophy that too oftentimes the resilience that we're trying to instill in children, they avoid obstacles and adults avoid obstacles. But actually the obstacles, according to the Stoics, can guide us and we should be seeking them out because that's how we improve. Um, no pressure, no diamonds, as the saying goes. Okay, these yeah. are going to be rapid fire. So I'm going to do, you, you've got 30 seconds. To, I'll read it to you and then tell me your first impression. <laughs> okay. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Uncle Wayne. No, oh, yeah, yeah, 100%, 100% true. Um, one of the things that uh, 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 my coach always says is the world isn't as it is, it's as you are. So the way that you look at things is, you know, the world is a mirror of your internal self. And so the way, once you change the way you look at things, the whole world around you starts to change. Well said. What one can be, one must be. Oh yeah. No, that one's, that one's a big, uh, uh, so, so the way I like to think about it is we have some gifts that the universe has bestowed upon us and it's our purpose to cultivate those gifts and share them with the world because that's, one of the things that make us um, unique. So what you can be, you must be. Yep, Abraham Maslow again. The belief that an individual can make a difference is the first step. The next is believing that you can be that person. Ooh, so wow. this gets right back to what you're saying about the gifts that we were given and the belief system that you have about those gifts um, and really overcoming the fear to take that first step. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the first obstacle in doing anything is just believing in yourself. And so uh, I think the ultimate goal of anything is just to achieve inner peace and self-love. And that's only starts by believing in yourself and believing that you're capable of doing what you set your mind to. Well said. And the last one is a seller angel's favorite. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed sipsters or citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And I say it's a seller angel's favorite because it was this exact quotation from the American playwright and author, Margaret Mead, that inspired us to start this company in 2009. So uh, you find a thoughtful group of committed citizens and you really can change the world. And yeah, I think absolutely. Wine enthusiasts for your brand uh, are a testament to that. So let me do this. I also have a poll question I want to share with people. Uh, Denise says, fake it till you make it. Interesting. Um, <laughs> not certain that was part of the discussion, but uh, all right. So one poll question this evening. And now you just learned all about Iggy's philosophy and meditative spirit and calming aspect of life to relieve stress and industry pressure iggy used to play jazz clarinet oops play play jazz clarinet pack his own ammunition and target shoot at distance drive an ice cream truck in saint helena meditate with cobras or assemble torturous 1000 piece jigsaw puzzles of one color Why is no one voting? Oh, there we go. Which of these seems the most germane and soothing? And Doug, I think she was also an anthropologist. Ivy, I love your old neighbor. Oh, you, your neighbor used to say fake it till you make it, not Margaret Mead's quote. I don't like your neighbor any longer. <laughs> all right we're gonna give this five four that's good Hans says where are the all the above answer options <laughs> five four three two one 
All right, now we have some interesting, interesting results. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. I, I, <laughs> anybody that said meditate with cobras, I would like you to uh, actually reveal yourself in the chat because that's hysterical. <laughs> uh, but I appreciate your your respect for his mental capacity. Do you want to share, Iggy, what you used to do? I, I mean, drive an ice cream truck would have been a cool one. I I, <laughs> wish. I drove an ice cream truck, um, but no, no, I used to I used to long distance uh, shoot at long distance competition. So making my own ammunition and uh, uh, and uh, target target shooting marksmanship was uh was quote unquote my yoga my yoga um about seven about seven years ago so i stopped competing when my son was born um and yeah it's been a while i do miss it though any interest in uh meditating with cobras um i mean i i do have a, a huge interest in meditating but not with things that are venomous and can kill me when i have my eyes closed yeah, or or they can actually kill you when your eyes are open too. Yeah, yeah, I'm not taking that chance. I already no. have enough things I can kill me already. <laughs> uh, all right, so let's. Um, I do want to go to in a second. Uh, show people where these two vineyards are, and Google Earth is our friend for how we do that. And I do. Let's do this. And Jeff, I do like that quote. So for those of you that are new, as I mentioned at the onset, you know, our wine region is here. When I say ours, Cellar Angels, we focus on what we believe to be arguably one of the top two or three wine regions in the world, uh, strictly because of the tapestry, the landscape, the microclimates, the geology, the soil structures. I've talked about this at length. It's just an amazing, the climate, there's only 3% of the globe has this similar Mediterranean climate. Uh, you can grow so many varieties here and it is just a canvas for uh, an, an artiste or a budding artiste. Uh, but these two wine counties are something spectacular. The valley or the vineyard to the north. Iggy, I'm going to give you my armchair assessment of why I like this Mill Creek vineyard. Okay. And then I want you to tell me, nope, that's not it at all, Martin, or no, that's pretty spot on. So, so here, if, if I pull back, well, obviously it's Valley floor. So what, what I do like about it, hang on. I don't know why it's there. I want to go here. There we go. That's the vineyard. So the other view is just kind of, we're North of St. Elena. Here we are now. Um, here you have some, some relief, but you're kind of in a little bit of a Delta between two rivers, certainly the Napa river here. And in my opinion, you have flooding receipt, flooding receipt, flooding receipt, you know, rushing down to the mountains, the erosion coming down. You have that going on for a million years. So there is probably all sorts of interesting things in this soil from rocks to shells to to different types of soils coming off of the mountain uh, that you may not find in other areas of the valley that in part a, a ton of different influences on the vines as they age. That's my interpretation of, of why I think this is a cool site. Yeah, you yeah, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a huge soil diversity. The drainage is pretty interesting because you could see, you could see there's a tree line right there where you're, yeah. So right there, that area, that boundary tends to flood a little bit. You know, there's a small creek that kind of goes through there and there's drainage on the other side of the property line, you can kind of see a road on the on the opposite. Yeah, right there. But down the middle, it's it's pretty dry. Um, the front of it where the thumbtack is, that whole area tends is pretty rocky. So you have really good drainage up there. And then as you get deeper into the back, the soil becomes way more rich um, with a tiny bit of clay loam in there. And so uh, it, uh, we had to pick um, a very specific, uh, two very specific rootstocks to kind of help us in case there was flooding. Although um, it the soil drains really well, the other benefit there is that the water tables pretty high. So those seventy year old grapes that we talked about earlier, they were dry farmed uh, oh. that whole time, and so 
um, if the plants are allowed to find their own roots, you, you really don't need to water them that much. Um, so that's another really good advantage to that. Um, and when you get, how did you yeah. decide on the rootstock? You said it when you wanted to be kind of flood resistant and what, yeah, and what, I, what clone did you pick and how did you decide on the cat um, clone? Uh, of course I'm blanking on the, on the clones right now. Um, uh, it's, uh, you go deep on stoicism and can't remember the clone. Yeah. I, you know, it's one of the things where I have written down, this is the problem of having smartphones nowadays is you write things <laughs> down and then, and then, and then it's like, I don't, the, the plants are already in the ground. I don't need, I don't need to remember. I, I, yeah. I don't need to remember um, that. that. That's um, out. Uh, but uh, uh, I think 16, 16C is one of them. And w the other one is uh, 114R or something like that. There's, it's, it's got a, a 1014 or 1114. Um, so what they are, the, uh, the 14R is an extremely like resilient vine. I mean, rootstock, that one's really popular. Um, they, you could plant that anywhere, almost anywhere from hillside down to valley floor. So, mm. uh, uh, so we got that one just because of its versatility. It's drought resistant and it's also, um, uh, like, uh, if it's sitting in really moist soil, uh, uh, uh it can withstand that too. And 1616C is just another good, uh, plant that, um, I mean, rootstock that gives us good, um, quality and, and a decent amount of yield. It, if we want to farm it to that. And so we right. were, we were choosing both rootstocks that if we want, if we had a stellar year and we wanted to really load the plants up, we could. Um, but also if we had to cut back maybe because of whatever the weather's given us in, um, in that specific year, we have that option. And so that's where that sort of micromanaging comes into play is that we have the way that we're going to um, uh, train the vines is going to give us a lot of options, whether we want to go for yield or quality or a combination of both. Um, it's just a little bit more in, intensive in the farming. Yeah. I just like, uh, you know, here's St. Helena to just give folks some perspective on how far up North Valley this vineyard site is. Uh, and it's, it's way up there, but uh, it definitely, you can see the topography change and the shifts and the, the soil structure is, is pretty nice there. Little different and actually different and the same as Coombsville because it too has some erosion from that standpoint. When I look at Coombsville down here in the lower right-hand corner, uh, it is right outside of Napa. Probably, I mean, this vineyard, I don't know where your vineyard is. It's a secret vineyard. So I just want folks to know that there's Coombsville and I think the the interesting thing about Coombsville is how long it was producing world class grapes that were unrecognized because they were going into so many other producers' bottles, mm -hmm. from you know Joseph Phelps insignia to Quintessa, and a lot of the big boys, as they say, were just farming Coombsville and not putting the name on the bottle until Coombsville got its own AVA. So why do you like Coombsville? Um, Coombsville and I can actually, so right around where your hand, where that little hand pointer is a little bit up about halfway between where your hand is and where the, uh, where that is. pin is, is about where the vineyard is. It's a, it's, it's a small one. It's, it's only about three acres. Um, and, uh, what I like about Coombsville is that it's a lot cooler climate. Um, uh, it's a lot cooler climate. So what, it, it, so what it allows us to do is it gives us really good um, uh, sugar and acid balance. So it allows us a longer hang time on, on the plant without having to sacrifice acidity uh, because mm -hmm. of the cool weather. That, that's what was kind of cool about the uh, 23 vintage this year because um, it was a little dicey because of rain and a little heat could have ruined everything. Um, I was kind of getting vibes like uh, 2011, which was a really hard year for farming. Um, but because it was such a cool summer, everything ripened super slow. So we were, we, we were able to pick at a lower uh, brick uh, um, uh, degree because, uh, uh, because of that cool weather, but the, the, the flavor 
of those bricks was a lot higher than we would on a, you know, on a hotter year. But overall, Coombsville compared to Mill Creek is about, I mean, I would say it's almost like there's like a three to five degree difference on average between, between St. Helena and Napa. Usually if it's really hot in St. Helena, it's like five, 10 degrees cooler in Napa. And so that just gives us a little bit more acidity, which is great for aging the wine. Um, yeah. And this is, as long this as we gives do. you an idea of where, I mean, most people know Coombsville is literally right outside of Napa. So you can be in downtown Napa at a tasting with Iggy and go out and see the vineyard. And if you make one of the two stoplights, you'll be there in 10 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Super close. Super close. Uh, all right. Let's talk about the 2017. hundred percent Cabernet. And when people are drinking it, what, what, what aromas should they be getting? What flavors should they be getting? Or what do you get out of it? And then I'm curious um, about pairings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this, um, what I like about this wine in particular compared to our H cab is that this, this one is very bold in a subtle way. It's very, very nuanced. And this one is a lot more fruit forward and sort of the way, uh, uh, this is the wine that encourages you to drink it faster only because of the impression it leaves on your palate. So when you have a sip, you get all of that fruit up front and then it, and then it, and then it tapers off and it leaves your palate wanting more of that fruit. So you go back for another sip in the glass. So it's got very bright, uh, very bright berry fruits, um, nice tannin structure, although it's nothing overwhelming and, and just enough oak in there to like, you know, to let you know it's there and to soften it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. But in terms of pairing and flexibility, I mean, this is a very flexible wine. The only thing I would, I wouldn't pair it with is, um, spicy food but you know i call this the pizza in netflix wine because you can just grab a movie grab a good pizza and then just hang out I've, I've had this wine with everything from hamburgers to leftover mac and cheese from the kids to um you know to uh ribeyes and steaks and uh salmon uh um i think this one we've even had swordfish with it uh you ever had wahoo no no just had some of that That's tonight, not... and I would be curious what this would be with. Okay, yeah, I mean, almost anything that 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 is fatty, especially you know, you know, a fatty fish, uh, definitely goes well with uh, just just spicy food is the only thing because it spicy food tends to bring out a more of the alcohol, the burn, the you know, the effects of the alcohol right. on your palate. So it makes the wine more aggressive, and it also makes the food taste a little bit hotter than it should be. So that's the only reason why I wouldn't pair it with those two. But other than that, I mean, yeah hamburgers to you know scallops it it all it all fits and then you mentioned tastings and where you don't talk really about the wine but you're getting to know the people that are coming in how do people taste with you yeah if you want to come visit so we're we're uh we're open by appointment so all you have to do is just go to our website dsellers.com and click on the visit us button and there's a little form to just let me know who you are and what time you want to come and we can, uh, we can accommodate up to about eight people, uh, comfortably. And, uh, yeah, we just sit down, we open up these three wines, the ones that you see here, and we start having a conversation. And if it, if the conversation takes us towards wine, fine. If it takes us to towards something else, it doesn't matter. We, the way I like to say it is we, uh, drink wine as a family, we make it as a family. And so we share it as a family. Oh, no, that's, I, I like that a lot. And I can uh, uh, attest to the family I, I mentioned, you know, early on, we've known Iggy for a long time and we're better people as a result. And then when he uh, wed Jackie, fell in love with her, the kids are delightful. Uh, it is a family. It is a second generation winemaker, which is great because it's not an easy industry. You don't make a lot of wine combined. What is total case production? Um, we're currently hovering about uh, 500 cases total among all three of them yeah so we're really small that's fantastic i uh encourage you folks uh hans and caitlin i just heard your accolades with regards to the 2017 there are currently only seven of these left on the website so uh from a napa 100 percent cabernet uh, it's about as good as it gets uh, hopefully yeah. this evening you learned a little bit about yeah. yourself, your thoughts, your feelings, because that's what wine allows us to do is just to be very introspective. Uh, we are humbled to have all of you allow us into your living rooms uh, on a Friday night basis. 
Uh, it means the world to us. And as we say every single week, be good to one another. Uh, kindness goes a long way. Be authentic. Be the people that we want to see in the world. And uh, everything will be much better off. Iggy, my friend, uh, so good to see you. Thank you for your time this evening and our best to uh, the significant others and better half and the kids. Yeah. 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 Thank you for having me on again. I'm so thankful for you guys and everyone who came, you know, to share this moment with us. So cheers and have a great evening. Awesome. We will see, we will see everybody next week. We're going to be discussing dessert wine uh, with Davis Estates. So join us next week. Sip episode 149. Thank you, everyone. Have a fantastic weekend and we look forward to seeing you next week. Cheers, all.